I want to say several things about that at the very beginning. I think we always should honor those who have given their lives. Um, we take this weekend in our country to honor those who've laid down their lives in service to provide the freedoms that we all enjoy. And I want to say right up front, having traveled now around, you know, different parts of the world at times, um, I'm very grateful to live in America and to have the freedoms that we have. And I think we all should be, and we do owe a debt of gratitude to people who have been willing to lay down their lives to, to make that possible. Um, at the same time, I also don't want to equate that with everything that we've done as a, uh, as a country has always been the right thing. There have even within our, within our own country been discussions and disagreements about should we be in this war? Should we go here? Should we go there? But let's not let that diminish the sacrifice that folks made wasn't their call in the first place, but they were willing to answer that call and to go give their lives for something. And we need to be very, very grateful for that. Jesus, in John chapter 15 and verse 13, says this, greater love has no one than this then he lay down his life for his friends. Jesus recognized the very thing that we're talking about today. There is no greater love in the world where someone would not just have their life taken, but would lay their life down. And of course we know that it's ultimately who Jesus was and what Jesus did. It's what he's done for each one of us. He, they didn't take Jesus's life. He laid it down for you and I. And you and I can never be more like Jesus than when we have the heart to lay down our lives. Now, I wanna do this this morning by asking you two questions. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a, you a big cop out right at the beginning of the sermon this morning. This is one of those lessons, you're gonna get out of it what you put into it. Okay, it's just the way that it is. Uh, if you sit and, sit and just simply listen this morning for the next 15 or 20 minutes, and that's pretty much all you do, then you're gonna leave and go, yeah, great, when's the cookout? It's a holiday weekend, family's in town or whatever. What I'm hoping you will do is really put some thought into the two questions I'm gonna ask you this morning. And perhaps you need to go away and to really think through these two questions because they are what this weekend is about in our country. But in its essence, this is what it means to follow Jesus. And so I'm gonna ask you two questions. The first question is this, what would you die for? What would you die for? I think most of us sitting here, maybe not everyone, but most, would say, I'd die for my family. I'd die for my kids. I believe if we, if we were pressed to run out in front of a truck or a bus and push our family out of the way, our kid, our wife, I believe most of us would do that. There's a phrase that was once said, it's been said many times, you really don't have anything to live for until you have something to die for. And what I wanna get you to ask this morning is, what would be on your list? Bro, I would die for this. And as we do that, I wanna give you a few things to think about. I believe that there is a greater good 
And I believe that's what Jesus understood. And I believe it's what many in the first century church understood. That there is something bigger than I am. Some cause that is greater than my life. That is worth me laying down my life for. That there is this this cause, this greater good, this thing that is out there that you and I value so much that we would say, I would die for that. There is a big, big difference in an individualistic existence and a sacrificial existence. And I believe what prevails today in America and even in the church a lot of times is an individualistic experience. Think about it. Every time that we hear something, something that's going on, something that has happened, is it not true that most of the time, the first thing we think is, how does that affect me? Did you think that when we started looking at pictures on the building? And yet the call to lay down our lives and to follow Jesus is the opposite of that. It is to have a sacrificial existence. And the first question is always, what is the best for my family? What is the best for God's kingdom? What is the best for this greater cause that you and I live for? We become... Very self-focused, don't we? Uh, I'm going to give you <laughs> two of Rick Overter's theories today, all right? And you are welcome to dismiss my theories. I cannot prove them by the Bible, all right? I, I, will, I will get to those in a minute. Um, the call to lay down your life is a family spirit. It is not an independent spirit. It is the call to say, this is my family. And as Jesus did, Ephesians chapter five, Paul says, Jesus, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Let me ask you something. How many of us would die for the church? You know, we live in a day and a time the church is diminished, d diminished. Give me God, but I don't care anything about the church. And Jesus says, no, no, I will die for my church. What would you die for? Now, here's one of my theories. And I'll illustrate it this way. When I was growing up, I played Little League Baseball. All right, I played baseball all the way through college. I have, and I, I, don't, I love sports, so I just want to go ahead and tell you that. And I, I still watched one of the most crazy, heart-thumping games I have ever seen in my life last night. If you watch the uh, Florida Gator women play the Texas A&M Aggies in softball for the chance to go to the Women's College World Series, it's the craziest thing I've ever seen. It was. You just, you just go watch the last inning and come back and tell me it wasn't crazy. Just the stuff that happens. So I'm being honest. I love sports. But let me go back to Little League. When I played in Little League, you showed up. You might have had one practice a week. You showed up on game day. You played the game. You're happy if you won. You're sad if you lost. We had one bat for the whole team. We had these ratty little old uniforms that, you know, we had sponsors. Like I played on the Elks Club team. And so a lot of the, you know, Rotary Club or the Elks Club would sponsor it and they would buy these uniforms and then they, you would just pass them on year after year after year after year. And these things were old and you couldn't even read what was on them. And that was it. Today, Kids walk up to the, to the ballpark. They practice three days a week, four days a week. They play umpteen games a week. They play on three different teams. 
They have a travel team that travels all over North Carolina. They spend amazing amounts of money. Parents do. Incredible numbers of hours. Running with our kids here. Running with our kids there. Playing this sport. We got them involved in two and three sports. No, just stay with me for a minute. This is going somewhere. They have personal coaches. Personal. I can just see the look on my dad's face. When I was 10 years old, dad, I need $100 a week to hire a hitting coach. I'm 10 years old. Oh, they got them, dime a dozen. I've umpired in the city leagues for many years and I've watched these kids. They walk up with their $100 bags on their back with two bats for just them, maybe three. And those bats cost anywhere from, oh, the cheapest ones are a hundred bucks and some of them can be $400. Two gloves, pair of cleats, maybe two pairs of cleats, and a home uniform, an away uniform, and a practice uniform. Sports today is a trillion plus dollar industry. Now here's Rick Overturf's theory. My theory is kids are the only thing that parents would die for anymore. And so what they're doing is, is they are putting their life into their kids and they don't mind spending that money and spending that time and wearing themselves out and going through life because they got nothing else to die for. And when you lose that, then you will pour yourself into the one thing you will die for. I believe that's one of the reasons that sports has gone crazy. Can you imagine if you and I put that kind of energy into planting more churches, into serving the poor, into laying down our lives? You see why we need to ask ourselves this question, what would I die for? Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. You know, I think back through all of these great men that followed Jesus, the apostles. Every one of those men laid down their life for the kingdom of God. Almost everyone died a martyr's death. Perhaps John died in exile on the Isle of Patmos, but from everything we know, all the other apostles literally did what Jesus had said and what Jesus himself did. They understood what it meant to lay down their life. They were willing to die for the kingdom of God. Second Corinthians chapter 11, I want you to just read through this list with me. This is Paul. Paul was that man. He was one of those men that ultimately laid down his life when we were in Rome a few years ago, we got to go see the place where they held Paul in chains. Paul didn't die there then, as we know from the end of the book of Acts, but he later did. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11. We're going to start in the middle of verse 23. I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently. Stop right there. How many of you today would walk out that doors and go to prison if it took it to defend this church or to defend your faith? Sign me up, bro. To prison we go. Don't know if I'll ever get out again. Uh, don't know how long I'll be there, but I'll go to prison. Paul lived so much of his life in prison. He says, and by the way, if you were going to be one of Paul's companions, you just might as well get ready to go to prison. Is that the kind of brother or sister you want to hang around? Bro, they are so given to the kingdom of God, they're going to lay down their life. If I hang around them, I'm going to get in some trouble. I'm probably going to go to prison. He says, 
I've been flogged more severely. You've studied flogging, right? I mean, we do that when we talk about the cross of Christ. Anyone in this room, would you, would you put that on your list and say, I would, I'd be flogged for this church? And been exposed to death again and again. Paul, Paul didn't even count the number of times that he thought to himself, this is it. This is the day I die. But I'm laying down my life. Five times I received from the Jews, 40 lashes minus one. Boy, there you go, legalism. <laughs> oh, a muck. 40 lashes, but just so we don't miscount and get in trouble with God, we'll only beat you 39 times. And Paul was subjected to that five different times. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. They thought he was dead. What will you do for the kingdom of God? We celebrate this weekend, and Paul goes on with the rest of his list. We celebrate those who have laid down their lives for our country. But let me rest you assured of one thing. The cause for which you will lay down your life is and always will be the best, most noble, and right cause. You don't need to have any doubts. We get to lay our lives down for the kingdom of God. I understand our hesitation about men's motives and men's causes, but that's not what you and I have been called to. What will you die for? I think it's so easy for us to, we, thank you for dying for our country so that I have all the freedoms I have. Great, let's have a barbecue. And we don't ask the deeper questions. Like, what would I die for? Because that's what I've been called to do. Second question is this. Who will you die with? Who will you die with? I've done a lot of reading over the years on this. I've been always intrigued by it. From World War, I'm sure one, but the reading I've done is World War II, the Vietnam War, some of the wars that have followed. To study the men who've come back. And there's a commonality among them. And in fact, from that, uh, you know, their assimilation back into society has always been a challenge for a lot of different reasons, things they saw, things they'd been through. Uh, there are a lot of organizations that were, you know, started to try to help those folks, things like the American Legion and some of these other places where men would get together. And one of the most common things you read about is men being very, feeling very lost when they came back. And a great reason for that is, is what I'm going to call foxhole friendships. You know, when you sit in a foxhole with someone and you think, I may die tonight, you get really bonded to the people you're next to. And the conversations that happen in those foxhole, oh man, it doesn't matter who you are, where you come, what color you are, or anything like that. You are men there trying to survive, and it gets real. And you're not trying to impress anybody with your credentials or what you've done in life or how much money you have and all that. You talk about your weaknesses and your failings and your fear of dying. And these men become so bonded together. And they, you know, that for, I, I would go to a foxhole with him. In other words, you're saying, I would die with that guy. Sadly enough, I read of one who came and he reached out to Christianity after he got back to look for answers in his life. And after a couple of years in the church, he went to the, what he called the pastor of that church. And he said, can't do this. I don't fit in here. I miss my buddies. 
I don't have anybody in this church I would die with. How sad. Looking for God and looking for answers, but finds more to connect with with people that he was ready to die with. You need to look around this room. If there are not people you would die with, you're in a scary place. Because what will happen is we will, we will develop a, 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 a selfish existence when we don't have people that we would go, that brother. Mm. All right, theory number two of Rick Overturfs, okay? Early on in our movement of churches, We were planning churches at an amazing pace, and we were going to places all over the globe. And, and, and groups of people were banding together and saying, I want to go to the former Soviet Union. I want to go behind the wall in China. I want to go to Africa. I want to go to South America. Brother, will you go with me? Yes, I will. Do you understand we might not come back. Do you understand the conditions? Do you understand it's going to be hard? And we planted them church after church after church. Well, what is the natural outcome of that? People you die with. Fox hold friendships. But we're going to take our families and we're going to move to a place we don't even yet speak the language. And we're going to take Jesus to those people. We've stopped doing it. And you know what's happened? We don't have those relationships. Too many of our younger generation have no clue what I'm talking about right now. Now, some of you sitting in here have done it. Randy and Denise Rao went to, I want to say shake your Djibouti because that's the only joke I can remember from it, but to, to Somaliland as it was called then. Part of what is Somalia, right? One of the reasons they're close with Melinda, who's now close to this church, because Melinda was on that group. How many relationships do you have that go so deep so far? I was with um, a couple of guys last week. I got to be down in Florida, and I went fishing uh, on a little trip with Jackson down there with two great brothers. One moved with us to plant the church in Jacksonville, Florida. Now, I know Jacksonville, Florida is not a third world country, and, but there's still something that will always bond us. You were willing to pick up your family and, and, and follow our leadership, and we go to Jacksonville, Florida together, and he is still there. He's the only one off the original team that's still there. We will always be bonded. I got to go fishing for a day with Martin Bentley. Any of you know Martin's name? Martin helped plant churches all over Central and South America. Um, one of the cool things was to hear him talk about the relationships he still feels with those guys. We went here together. Oh, with him. We talked about a lot of different people. And he always had these glowing things to say because these are his foxhole friends. So my theory is we don't have enough people we would die with. That's why I think our churches aren't growing the way they did. Is because we've settled in and we've become comfortable and, oh, yeah, I, I'll go out maybe and, uh, you know, serve in a soup line with you. Yeah, I'll do that. But how many of us would lay down our lives with someone? And if we get that heart back, I think we'll understand more. So let's look at three verses here as we close. 
I mentioned Paul, so I just picked Paul. And I want you to listen to the way that he describes um, the guys around him. Philemon, verse 23. Epaphras, <laughs> my fellow prisoner. How many of us would have loved to have been a companion of Paul's? That's another one of those questions you better go think about today. You better go, oh, it sounds awesome. I mean, sure, I would love to go around the world and plant churches and to do all these amazing things and watch all these miracles and do all this. And yeah, you would have done a lot of it from prison if you'd been Paul's fellow worker, fellow prisoner. But Epaphras was a guy that would die with Paul. He was a foxhole friend. You go over to Romans 16. Verse 3, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. They risk their lives for me. Not only I, but all of the churches of the Gentiles are grateful for them. Have you risked your life for this church? Have you risked it for a brother or sister in this church? That's what it meant to hang around Paul. Look in the book of Philippians chapter 2. Just remind me not, to, oh, that's not my sit. I'm in backwards anyway. It's a good thing I didn't try to sit down today. And that just broke. Uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians chapter 2 in verse 29. Paul talking about Epaphroditus says this. Verse 29, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor men like him. You know what I'd love to see us do? I'd love to see us, let, let's don't have a Memorial Day weekend or we can, but let's have another weekend where we honor men and women in the kingdom that have laid down their lives. Because my Bible, by the way, tells me to do that. Honor men like him. I am so grateful for the people that, that, that paved the path in Africa where we work right now. And I hope we never forget, there were brothers that, Mark Ottenweiler, perfect, left, left a career as a doctor in America. Come on, you got it made. And has spent his life trying to help the kids of Africa. We should honor men like that. Paul says, because he almost died for the work of Christ. Man after man after man. Do you, do you know the names Andronicus, Junius, and Aristarchus? What they all have in common? They all went to prison with Paul too. And we hadn't even talked about Luke and Onesiphorus and all the other. You get the idea Paul was surrounded by men and women he would die with. And he knew they would die with him. So I'm going to ask again, who would you die with? Can you write down their names? We'll close with this verse. It's a verse I know you know because we quote it a lot. If any man come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Are you willing to follow Jesus and lay down your life?